On Monday, we began talking about um, the great French painter um, Jacques-Louis David, um, who was trained um, in the academy, who um, attempted to win the Prix de Rome a number of times, and um, who finally um, did win um, the Rome Prize and went to, to Rome in 1775, where he stayed for approximately five um, years. So the 1770s are a very crucial, important period for David in terms of his early success. But these are also years of grave financial strain for France. Exhausted uh, financially by the Seven Years' War in which France had aided Austria um, for control of Germany against Britain and Prussia, the revenues uh, of uh, France were dangerously low. Uh, added to this were the prodigal extravagances of the French court in the 18th century, exemplified, one might say, simply by looking at the clothing and the setting uh, of uh, these two French kings of the 18th century, Louis XV um, on the left, uh, by the great French uh, portrait painter Hyacinthe Rigaud and Louis XVI um, on the right. There was not only this luxurious lifestyle um, and the gross mismanagement of public finances, but there was constant recourse to loans, to borrowing, to cover deficits that created a huge national debt. Gosh. Sounds so familiar. Louis XV was the profligate and ineffectual great-grandson of Louis XIV, who finally died of smallpox in 1774. And it is Louis XV who is said to have proclaimed, après moi, le déluge, after me, the flood, after me, the destruction. His successor, was Louis XVI, who was only 20 years old and unable to understand the need for drastic reform. Actu uh, after all, he had lived in this bubble um, of royalty. Louis XVI was married off to an Austrian princess named Marie Antoinette, and he lived with her a luxurious life at the great Baroque palace of Versailles, which most of us have heard about. Versailles becomes the model for all great uh, palaces um, in Europe. After a successful stay in Italy, David returns to France in 1780. He is made an academician of the academy. He begins to train his own pupils and to exhibit at the Salon. So things are going well. He received a commission from the state and returned to Rome between 1784 and 1785 in order to paint his first great painting, the first so-called neoclassical painting that begins um, the movement that is considered to be the first great movement of the modern period, neoclassicism, one word, N-E-O-C-L-A-S-S-I-C-I-S-M neoclassicism. The work is called The Oath of the Horatii. The subject is in some ways a response to an increasing emphasis on the part of official French art to embrace a more serious philosophical message that was part of the official propaganda designed to deter criticism from the immorality of monarchy, who are not only spending too much, but who celebrated this profligate life by commissioning works from Rococo artists such as Boucher, you remember Boucher, and Watteau, um, all these celebrations of decadent love and classical mythology uh, that seem to be um, outside uh, of the reality of France at the end of the 18th century. The painting certainly reflects on David's personal belief that, quote, art 
should have no other guide than the torch of reason. Quote, art should have no other guide than the torch of reason. David always felt that art um, not only needed to be beautifully done, but it needed to teach something. The Oath of the Horatii dates to 1785. It's a good size work, 14 feet across, 11 feet high. It's a painting that marks the beginning of the modern period, amazingly enough, in the 18th century. One, one of the first things that um, I want to point out to you and I want to ask, because you're looking at it, and if you had the history of art 1B, um, you looked at Renaissance and Baroque paintings, and they looked a little bit like this. What I mean by that is that um, they, they represent a rather realistic looking three-dimensional space. I mean, it's illusion, but it's very nicely done with perspective. There's a clearly an understanding of human anatomy. There's some very nice composition, balance of elements going on here. Um, there is a clarity um, of the storyline. And in many ways, then, we'd have to say, well, this painting is very similar to traditions of Western painting since the Renaissance. How is this painting different? Because many Renaissance paintings also had morals, um, had a kind of ethical story uh, behind them. But this painting is different. It is viewed by Marxist art historians and others as a kind of pre-revolutionary Republican manifesto. In other words, it's meant to be a kind of message uh, to the populace um, about the state. Right? That state with a capital S, meaning monarchy, for instance, at this time, France. It is in many ways the culmination of an entire century's desire for greater morality of subject and aesthetic simplicity. And when I mean simplicity, this painting does not contain all of the puffy pink clouds and little Cupid figures that you find in Baroque and Rococo art, right? Right, so it is very different um, in that way. The direct inspiration for the subject of the work comes from a performance um, uh, of a play by a 17th century dramatist um, who wrote a play in which, quote, passion is subordinated to duty. Passion is subordinated to duty. In other words, passion is not the important thing here. Duty is. Stoicism is. And of course, passion is part and parcel of Baroque and Rococo paintings. That's what you're attempting to get across, the passion of love, of emotion. The play, uh, written in 1639 by um, a French playwright called Corneille, C-O-R-N-E-I-L-L-E, C-O-R-N-E-I-L-L-E, -L -L -E, dealt with a scenario taken from Roman history. So let me give you the, the story um, in a nutshell, and then we'll see where David decided to stop, and that sounds like a good um, part of the story for my painting uh, to concentrate on. So the story goes that um, there were um, two uh, powerful um, city-states um, in, in, uh, in ancient Italy, um, Rome and Alba. And they were fighting for political domination and territory. And there were disagreements. Um, and it got to the point that, that there was clearly going to be conflict, that war was going to break out. It was decided uh, then at sort of the last minute by some of the elders of Rome and Alba that it shouldn't be a full-scale war, that they could decide the issues uh, by simply sending um, a limited number of men into battle and whoever won one for that city, for that state. So um, it's decided there just happened to be triplets who live in Alba, 
triplets, males who live in Rome, and it's decided that those triplets will be matched up to fight to the death, all right, from two different families. The uh, Roman family are the Horatii, so there you get part of the title. Um, the um, Alban family are the Curatii. I know that you are very enamored of the fact that those names sound very much alike. So the Curatii from Alba is spelled capital C-U-R-I-A-T-I-I. -I. Again, capital C-U-R-I-A-T-I-I. -I. So the Horatii would represent Rome. The Curatii would represent um, Alba. Um, so it sounds like we've, we've set, set this up. Whoever comes out alive, one of them's got to come out alive. That uh, state will be named um, the winner. But it's a little more complicated because um, one um, of the one of the um, Horatii brothers is married to a Curatii sister. Are you still with me? She's in Alban. She's from Alba, and they have children. So she's going to lose out no matter what, right? She'll either lose all of her brothers or she'll lose her husband. Um, another of the Horatii uh, women um, is engaged to a Curatii. So this is a very interesting um, problem here because there's going to be tremendous loss and it's going to be, obviously, on an emotional level, at least for the females. Do you notice the separation of males and females? Um, it's both balanced and asymmetrical in the way they are represented. Clearly, the women represent passion and emotion, while the men represent strength and stoicism. So it's very stereotypical in the terms of the way they are represented. David's painting shows the moment before the battle when the Horatii swear on their swords held up by their father. They will fight and die for Rome, while, as I said, the sisters are despairing on the right-hand side. The painting has traditionally been seen as a reflection of David's politically didactic purpose and a portent of the ideals of the French Revolution. But the French Revolution is four years away, and David would have had no, no idea that this revolution was going to happen. But he knew that France was in bad straits. For David, the work reflected more on his belief that art should teach us something, that it should forcefully contribute to our education. Now, he is also giving us a message about sacrifice. And that's a very important message in the context of the financial straits of France at the time, and I'm going to talk about that. The heroic, rigid stances of the young uh, brothers is contrasted with the collapsing, curvilinear shapes of the women who are already mourning. You notice that? You get these hard edge shapes, these angled lines, and then these soft curvilinear elements. And it's absolutely brilliant uh, compositionally. Manly virtues such as courage and patriotism and unwavering loyalty to the state are emphasized by the men who show no emotion except steadfastness to carry out uh, what they need to do. Um, whereas sorrow and personal despair um, is symbolized, are symbolized by, by the women. Stylistically, David did not abandon, as I said a moment ago, the tradition of the pictorial space based on a knowledge of Renaissance perspective um, and anatomy and the idealization of form. But it's very interesting what we're going to start to see here. And again, I know you're going to go, what? <laughs> what? You'll, I'm, I'm kind of setting it up here for you. You'll see it eventually if you don't see it now. Um, David is already uh, delimiting the space. So delimiting meaning he's reducing 
that sense of three-dimensionality that is created by the illusion of depth when you use perspective, yes? Perspective is an illusion created by artists to make it feel as though the painting is a window on reality. It's not. It's a flat surface. I wonder how that's going to sound. Um, so what we have here is David beginning to limit, or what I call delimit the space. Eventually, by the time we get to the 20th century, we're going to see artists who are emphasizing the absolute flat surface of the canvas. So that's where we're headed here. And David is just starting us off. So what were the sources of influence um, for him to do that? Well, what I'm showing you um, down below um, is um, a um, relief drawing called The Funeral of Patroclus. Patroclus or Patroclus is a figure of the Trojan War, and it's spelled P as in Paul, A-T-R-O-C-L-U-S a relief drawing of around 1780 that is clearly based on David having looked at Roman sarcophagy, at Roman carved relief uh, coffins that have this procession on the surface of the coffin in relief of figures who move from left to right or right to left. And you see the predominant imagery is right on the surface. Do you, does everyone see that? Do you have trees and mountains in the background? No, there's nothing there. We're intended to look um, at the uh, figures. So David creates a very shallow sort of picture box. Um, it is defined by severely simple architectural framework. Um, and the obvious source for the way he has set his figures up so that our eyes move literally on the front of the picture plane, as if this was a, a stage setting. And remember, it's based on a play. And so it could be a stage setting. And you know with plays, the players need to play to the audience. And you need to be come forward. All right, so um, here we have figures at basically at the front of the picture plane, not really moving out and in to try to further define a deep space, but they're very much left um, to right and at the front of the picture plane. That's delimiting. That's limiting um, the space again. It's flattening um, the space. The obvious source for David in his figures was in his study of Roman antique uh, reliefs. He made many studies for the Oath of the Horatii. We know that even the head of the father, the patriarch, um, is based on the famous Roman equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius, which stands in Rome on the Capitoline Hill, even though, by the way, I have to tell you, there's a copy there now. They brought it inside. Uh, but th I just want to show you, this is just the head of a very famous equestrian statue uh, from the time of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius. So it comes from the Roman Empire, about the third century is Marcus Aurelius CE. Do you see how David directly quotes it? So, so the influence of Rome and antique art is, is clearly very important um, in this work. The message was clear um, and of a type with which the pre-revolutionary French public could readily identify. The French public could interpret stories from ancient history as metaphors for contemporary politics. It's just like art today. Artists make statements about what is going on um, in ways that often have to be explained to us but make a great deal of sense because they are responding to the historical context. In France, then, at the end of the 18th century, self-sacrifice meant uh, that social privileges had to be given up, that the upper classes uh, needed to pay their fair share. Uh, and again, I'm getting flash forwards <laughs> as I'm talking. There was such social privilege and so many in French society, or one might say so few, associated with the nobility and the church 
who paid no taxes that there were these stirrings that we need to pay taxes fairly uh, and equitably. Um, the picture painted under royal patronage was a sensation when it was exhibited in Paris in 1785. The neoclassical style would become the semi-official voice, the style of the French Revolution. Now, I went forward a little bit quickly, but we're going to jump right into this work, also by David, just a couple of years later. But in terms of background here, keep in mind that in early 1787, all right, this painting is completed in 1787, an assembly of church nobility and representatives of the bourgeoisie. Who are the bourgeoisie? Not the upper class. So what are we talking about in this country right now? Who's paying for everything? The middle class. Bourgeoisie means the middle class. Um, so that's spelled B as in boy, O-U-R, G-E-O-I-S-I-E, -I bourgeoisie, middle class. One more time, B-O-U-R-G-E-O-I-S-I-E. The three so-called estates of, um, of the French public, the church, the nobility, which means the upper class, um, and the bourgeoisie, leaving out some people there, uh, were summoned to an assembly of the Controller General of Finances. Reforms were designed to eliminate the budget deficit. And those reforms were that taxes would be increased for the privileged classes. It was resisted. It was rejected. A shortage of grain in 1787 led to isolated grain riots. The peasants were unhappy about their unfair burden in what was literally, into the 18th century, a feudal system of government in which only a certain number of people were paying um, their taxes and others resisted any attempt on the part of the government to curtail their privileges and their tax-exempt status. The impulse toward practical reform was pushed forward by the middle class, by the bourgeoisie, whose influence was beginning to intensify. And I cannot believe the parallels that I'm thinking of today with what I'm, um, with what I'm talking about. By the way, these grain riots that I'm talking about um, literally uh, would lead um, eventually some to say that historically the queen of France at the time said when she heard there wasn't enough grain for, to make bread, what did she say, supposedly? Let them eat cake. She never said that, but that's what we know to history. I'm actually recording right now. David's sympathies and allegiances at this time were increasingly liberal and socially progressive. He did not receive a royal commission in 1786, but he undertook a private commission for a distinguished nobleman. That's the painting that you see here, The Death of Socrates. 1787, same year. When he viewed this painting at the Salon in 1787, remember David has absolute access to the Salon. Yes, he's a master. When he viewed this painting at the Salon of 1787, the American ambassador to France, Thomas Jefferson, wrote, the best thing is the death of Socrates by David. It is a superb painting. I sort of like to bring that in so that you see other things are going on in the world, in the new world. That's Thomas Jefferson talking about David. In the death of Socrates, David continued his neoclassical style by creating a work, first of all, whose subject is based in the ancient world, in, the, in stories of the ancient world, and a story of high moral resolve. 
because here the Greek philosopher Socrates, whom we see seated on his bed with all of his disciples around him, including, according to tradition, uh, Plato, Socrates has been condemned by his own state for corrupting the youth, and he has been condemned to death, and he has to take poison. So this is the moment, and this is the story that David um, chooses to tell us about. Um, Socrates is a patriot. I mean, he could have run, uh, run away, he could have escaped, he could have left Athens, um, he could have gone someplace else, he could have created, you know, more of a stir. But he said, this is what the state says is the best thing for everyone. And so I will sacrifice myself for the good of the state, despite the fact that it was deemed unjust. He speaks while reaching for the cup of hemlock. His body is idealized and muscular and erect. Now look, look people, that's an old man there. <laughs> yeah, I mean he is. He's got a beard, he's got gray and white hair. Yes, he's an older man. Look at his physique. Look at him. Look at those pecs. Look at that leg. Um, it's, it, it's a gorgeous body. Why? Because David was trained in the academy. And you idealize and you make more perfect, right? So that's something that we're going to see over and over again in these kind of academic classical um, works. Albert Boehm, in his book, Art in an Age of Revolution, notes, quote, the dominance of the patriarch, again, in this painting. So for David, you see the leadership and the one who promotes um, the um, suicide, in this case, for the good of the state, for standing up or doing what is right for the state, is the patriarch. It was the father in the Oath of the Horatia. And here um, it is um, Socrates. Notice that like the Oath of the Horatii, Socrates uh, represents strength and resolve and stoicism while his disciples are all collapsing around him, basically. So like the female figures in the Oath of the Horatii. That is, they say, in, uh, except for Plato, who sits at the foot of the bed and simply puts his head down and seems very contemplative. Like the Oath of the Horatii, you have this very austere setting. Again, it's more like a stage play, very delimited space. Even though, again, perspective is used here, there is a large open doorway to the left, that archway. And in fact, we are allowed to see um, some people who are leaving. In fact, this is Socrates' wife who um, is in the background, and she's waving, waving goodbye. Um, and then we see the emotional impact um, on um, Socrates' um, students. Um, the varying, varying actions of the different um, individuals is actually based on David having studied classical um, statues. Um, the pointing finger of Socrates um, and the, the body, uh, in fact, the kind of body represented is actually a direct quote. And I'm going to be dependent now on people who had the history of art 1B. Where have you seen this before? Yes. School of Athens, Raphael, uh, in the Vatican, where David would have seen it. There he is. Better have brought it in. Details of everyone. The wife leaving. Yes. Here is the center of the great fresco known as the School of Athens by the Renaissance painter Raphael. Um, here you have Plato and Aristotle. Um, Plato on the left. And you can see that um, that image of Plato is what is used to represent um, Socrates um, or the death of Socrates. So it's not only um, the antique tradition, but the Renaissance tradition 
that influences David, but of course the Renaissance was a revival of the classical world. In 1787, the same year as the death of Socrates was painted and exhibited at the Salon, proposed reforms designed to eliminate the budget deficit by increasing taxes um, was ultimately rejected. So um, ironically, the theme of self-sacrifice for the good of the state, for the good of everyone, contrasts with the selfish, self-serving aristocracy who refused to give up power and privilege. The uh, assembly refused to take responsibility for reforms, that is the large governing body, and instead called um, together the so-called Estates General, which was convened at the palace at Versailles. So this is a meeting of the Estates General in May of 1789. Representatives of the clergy, the first estate, the nobility, the second estate, and commoners, the third estate, was convened um, and immediately was divided over voting rights. Um, the first estate and second estate didn't think the third estate should have the same equal number of votes. And after they were unable to agree, the third estate said fine, and they declared themselves a national assembly. They removed themselves from the first and second estate. That basically snowballed in terms of the beginnings of a revolution. If you're not going to um, see any compromise in sight, and in July of 1789, the citizens of Paris seized the Bastille, the great prison which had, of course, more of the third estate than anyone else uh, in it, um, a symbol of tyranny, and um, opened uh, the Bastille, uh, marched on the king's palace at Versailles in October, and brought the king and his family back to Paris. The French Revolution began in July 1789. The Ancien Régime, as it is known, Ancien Régime, the old regime, the old uh, is out, A-N-C-I-E-N, -E Ancien Régime, R-E-G-I-M-E, -E, is destroyed, and a new administrative system is created by an assembly, a national assembly. When the king, Louis XVI, tried to escape from France in the summer of 1791, he was captured with his family and brought back to Paris and condemned to death for treason. He was executed by guillotine in 1793, as was his wife, Marie Antoinette. And guess who drew Marie Antoinette on the way to the guillotine? Jacques-Louis David. <clears throat> David became a deputy to the National Assembly and the head of the Committee of General Security. He personally signed over 140 arrests and death warrants, and he voted for the execution of Louis XVI. When royalists, that is, those who were allied with the Ancien Régime, with the king and the royal family, tried to seize power back in late 1795, a young general named Napoleon Bonaparte crushed them. Napoleon was on the side of the revolution. The National Convention was dissolved, and a new government called the Directory was established. You can see this is a time period in which things are happening rapidly. Under the directory, the middle class has assumed power. And eager to spread the principles of the revolution, France went to war with Austria and Prussia beginning in 1792. This was a big mistake. After fighting as far afield as Egypt, Napoleon Bonaparte returned to France to great acclaim, and he is the one who overthrew the Directory and proclaimed the end of the revolution with the establishment of what he called the Consulate, which was specifically based on the concept of a Roman Republic with 
consult. So C O N S U L A T E. And I show you a timeline here, which you can see the period of the so called reign of terror, the directoire, the directory, and then the establishment of the consulate in 1799 under uh, Napoleon.